My name is Don Emerson. I run the Southeast Asia program in the Sharonstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University. I'm delighted to say that our speaker today is Gita Widiawan, a visiting scholar in the Sharonstein Asia Pacific Research Center, abbreviated APARC. He is a successful businessman and philanthropist, former Indonesian Minister of Trade, advisor of universities such as Harvard and Yale, jazz musician, badminton enthusiast, and the recipient of Indonesia's coveted Bintang Mahaputra Adi Pradana, an award given to Indonesians who have made extraordinary contributions to their country's integrity, continuity, and success. And he hosts a very popular podcast, Endgame. 613 people have registered to watch this webinar, which gives you an idea of the audience that he attracts. And it is in that context that I'm delighted to say that this is not the first time that he has appeared here at Stanford. This is his second webinar. <clears throat> the first webinar was entitled Whither Southeast Asia? This was in October. On that occasion, Gita talked about the future of Southeast Asia but did not spell out his own advice, his own model, his own vision for the future of Southeast Asia. And that is what he is going to do today in a presentation entitled Meritocracy, Democracy, and the New Political Economy of Southeast Asia. Ita, it's always yours. Thank you so much, Don. Terima uh, kasih for the invitation. This is not the first time we've been talking about Southeast Asia but it is a topic that resonates with you, with me, and with the 700 million people living in that region. I think it's safe to say that the development of any country around the world hinges on the degree to which it can push forward with certain things. Uh, some would argue that it depends on where it's located, its geostrategic positioning, its natural resources, its form of government, its leadership, its governance, and whatever it can do with respect to its pre-existing resources. I would also argue that recently, there seems to be an observation with respect to the correlation between the movement of monetary and economic capital with respect to the degree to which a particular nation or country promotes liberal democracy mm -hmm. or the attributes or values within what's mm -hmm. supposed to be a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Let me start out with slide number three, just to give mm -hmm. some background on the political systems that are prevailing in Southeast Asia. And when I say Southeast Asia, it is the 10 countries mm -hmm. uh, within Southeast Asia at the exclusion of East Timor or Timor-Leste uh, by way of the fact that, you know, we do not have you know, sufficient data points for Timor-Leste at the moment. But Southeast Asia from a form of government standpoint is pretty much broken up into three buckets. First one is a set of countries that are monarchical in nature. And these are namely Brunei, which is an absolute monarchy. One guy runs both the government and the state. And the second would be Cambodia, where one guy runs uh, the government and the other guy supposedly runs the state. And the third country would be Malaysia, mm -hmm. similarly, uh, one guy runs the state and another guy runs the government. And a fourth uh, would be Thailand, where one guy runs the state and another guy runs the government. The second bucket of countries from a form of government standpoint in Southeast Asia uh, is really consisting of two countries, uh, i.e. Lao PDR and Vietnam, which mm -hmm. are one political party system in nature. And the third bucket would be what I call the non-monarchical and non-one-party system, i.e. Singapore, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Myanmar. 
these are sort of like the broad you know, observations with respect to the form of government or forms of government that are existing in Southeast Asia. Now, to give you a bit of a context on the role of meritocracy, the role of liberal democracy with respect to the deployment of monetary and or economic capital to any particular country in Southeast Asia, it's probably helpful to look at the economic trajectory uh, of China uh, versus Southeast Asia. This is an illustration of how the GDP per capita of China has fared vis-a-vis -vis that of Southeast Asia. As you can see from this chart, uh, the GDP per capita of China has gone up by more than nine times in the last 30 years, whereas that of Southeast Asia has only gone up between two to three times, to be more precise, 2.7 times. There are reasons as to why there has been an underperformance or economic underperformance uh, within Southeast Asia uh, as compared to that of uh, China. This is, I think, uh, quite telling in terms of why the GDP per capita of Southeast Asia has underperformed with respect to that of China. Southeast Asia, in general, uh, lacks competitiveness, uh, lacks the ability to get people to be competitive. And this is manifested in many ways, but one illustration of uh, this lack of comp uh, competitiveness is basically the extent to which uh, the particular government issues business licenses uh, on a per 1,000 adult people basis, as you can see, Countries such as the Philippines and Indonesia are issuing less than one business license uh, on a per 1,000 uh, adult people basis as compared to the Singapore's and the China's of the world, which have been able to issue between eight to nine business licenses on a per 1,000 adult people basis. We can see also some encouraging signs where Vietnam and Thailand have been on the rise, uh, but compared to what Singapore, which really is an anomaly within Southeast Asia and China, which is far different uh, in terms of you know, where they stack up vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done by many Southeast Asian countries to improve their ability to basically be more competitive. There are, I think, um, a number of observations as to why the number of licenses are not issued to the extent that we're seeing in Singapore and China. One certainly could be or would be the lack of uh, risk-taking propensity within any individual or the average individual within the respective country. The second also would be you know, a reflection of uh, the quality of bureaucracy or meritocracy within the governments, uh, and also to some extent the leadership of that particular country. The third observation would also be with respect to you know, how much capital is available, how much money is available within the respective uh, countries. There's another reason as to why Southeast Asia's GDP per capita has underperformed was, uh, with respect to that of China in the last 30 years. It is an illustration of the educational attainment uh, you know, by Southeast Asian countries. Uh, unfortunately, many of the big Southeast Asian countries uh, have not scored uh, well enough uh, on PISA. PISA is uh, the basically uh, illustration of uh, the degree to which a 15 year old or the average 15 year old uh, would you know, be able to attain uh, on lingual and also scientific proficiencies. Clearly on this illustration, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia are laggards. Uh, they are scoring below the global average, whereas Vietnam, they have basically come around in a big way. They have been able to not only score well above the global average, but they have positioned themselves as the number two nation or country in Southeast Asia. Singapore consistently has been able to position themselves at uh, number two in the last many years. China, of course, is at number one. So the degree of <clears throat> educational attainment or lack thereof, uh, I think speaks for why you know capital is uh, moving only to a certain extent uh, to certain countries in Southeast Asia. The last explanation as to why Southeast Asia's GDP per capita has underperformed with respect to that of China in the last 30 years 
is, is really illustrated on page number 10. And this speaks of uh, the foreign direct investment. As you can see, uh, the largest recipient of foreign direct investment in Southeast Asia has been consistently Singapore in 2021. They were able to get you know, $105 billion, whereas Indonesia was only able to get about $30 billion in the same year. But if we deep dive a little bit more by taking a look at the FDI on a per capita per year basis, this is very telling. Uh, most countries in Southeast Asia have only been able to get FDI on a per capita per year basis uh, within the range of $100 to $400, mm -hmm. whereas Singapore uh, have been able to get an FDI on a per capita per year basis of eighteen to $19,000. Mm -hmm. So does that speak of something? It does to some extent uh, speak uh, of the degree to which the world trust Singapore in terms of its system, in terms of its meritocracy, in terms of its governance, and to some extent in terms of its leadership. And this is, I think, uh, something that, that needs to be looked at very deeply by not just you know the other members of Southeast Asia, but the world over in terms of how we can actually be helpful uh, with respect to Southeast Asia. Let me just make one uh, or two additional uh, remarks with regards to you know, why, um, you know, liberal democracy has not been uh, moving in the kind of direction and speed that Southeast Asian countries should have been at. There is some correlation between liberal democracy and the role of monetary or economic capital. But the point that I want to make uh, from this slide is that you can see that some of the more prosperous countries in Southeast Asia, particularly Singapore, it actually runs on a Gini coefficient ratio uh, higher than you know, other countries such as uh, Indonesia uh, and also Thailand. Uh, it, it, it's you might want to explain yeah. to those in the audience that are unfamiliar with the Gini coefficient. Is it better to be high or low? Give us an idea yeah. of what that stands for. It is an illustration mm -hmm. of the degree of inequality. So the higher the Gini coefficient ratio, the more unequal, the higher the inequality of a particular economy. However, broadly speaking, if we take a look at the Gini coefficient ratios for most countries in Southeast Asia, given the fact that South, Southeast Asian economies are still developing in nature, the Gini coefficient ratios are not as high as those in much more developed economies such as China and the United States. So I, I, I do say this with uh, the recognition that you know, there is a point of contention here uh, on behalf of Southeast mm -hmm. Asia that there is room for growth for Southeast Asian countries to be better liberal democracies because the inequality or degree of inequality may not be as high as what we might have seen in countries such as, you know, the United States and, and, and China. One last illustration that I want to make in the context of why the development and the advancement of talent and meritocracy in Southeast Asian countries it is the degree of political fragmentation in uh, many of these countries. We can see in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Myanmar, Indonesia, where we're looking at you know political parties uh, that are you know in the numbers of you know the tens, and and it has basically you know forced uh, you know forces to coalesce uh, to the point where there is a bit of a discount in the way that you know the government could be run by whoever gets to be in a position of leadership so in some i just want to make the case that while we are seeing an abundance of liquidity uh, in many if not most of the developed economies around the world amounting to about 90 to 100 trillion dollars uh, Southeast Asia has not been a big beneficiary of this movement of economic capital from the developed economies on the basis that perhaps the <clears throat> talent cultivation, perhaps the governance, perhaps the leadership, perhaps the meritocracy within many, if not some of these Southeast Asian countries uh, are not to the levels uh, where we would have, uh, you know, we would want them to be. If I can respond, uh, there's a lot to be said about what you've said. And let me just begin by asking for 
a little more detail on the shape of Southeast Asia, economic, but also political, that you would like to see. It, it strikes me, for example, if political fragmentation is such an important dimension, the implication being that political fragmentation is bad then doesn't it follow from that, that the best system for the countries of Southeast Asia is one party states? Now, admittedly, uh, even in Singapore, there is technically speaking more than one party, but de facto in practice, it's a one party state and one party has been in power for decades. Right? So I don't quite follow the political cost of the kind of economic prescription that you prefer. We should also talk about meritocracy. Who will be responsible for making sure that those individuals at the top of the leadership are kind of an elite, you know, they have high PISA scores and so forth, they've been educated at all the best universities, Harvard and whatever, right? But where's the accountability? Because there's, you know, there's no indication just because you have a higher degree and know a lot about STEM fields, right? Uh, science, technology, mathematics, and all of that. Do you have empathy? You may not. Are you corrupt? The word corruption, if I'm not mistaken, did not appear during your remarks. So how would your model take into account the danger of the over-concentration of power at the top, particularly perhaps with a meritocracy, the lack of accountability, if you will, and then, you know, the uh, to what I guess I, what I'm really saying is to what extent are the solutions not simply economic? And if they are sociological and even cultural, perhaps even historical, yeah. then can we be realistic in suggesting that they, you know, this may not be as malleable a situation subject to change based on a model, whether it's based on Singapore or some other model, that some of the aspects of the future of Southeast Asia are simply beyond our control, that we will have to witness them rather than be able to control the direction that they take. Yeah. That's, that's, a, like, that's a whole bunch of questions. That's like seven questions in one. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> but pick, pick and choose. You don't have to answer no, them No, no, these are great questions. Uh, I, I actually had a slight to specifically talk about corruption, but in the interest of abbreviating oh, okay. the, 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 the okay. time Sorry. with which I, yeah. I wanted to articulate right. uh, the thesis. Uh, corruption has been one of the reasons as to why Southeast Asia has underperformed with respect to not just China, but many other regions or countries or economies around the world. And it is a function of many things, one of which is, of course, education. Mm -hmm. uh, but another is really the quality of leadership that's been ushered by the people mm -hmm. up to the top. And with regards to the political mm -hmm. fragmentation, I'm all for diversity. But what, what I have witnessed uh, in not just my country, Indonesia, but in other countries within Southeast Asia, is that the political fragmentation is manifested in a number of political parties that coalesce, but do not even share the ideology, do not even share their views with respect to how the fiscal space ought to be managed, how the foreign policy ought to be managed, how the monetary policy should be managed. Uh, these are basically exercises of convenience mm -hmm. for the sake of basically attaining power, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm all for diversity. I'm all for diversification. I'm all for, you know, more to be included in picture. But if those that are included in picture do not even share certain basic things with respect to what needs to be governed and what needs to be managed and how things ought to be managed, it is a discount to how you're going to be able to govern. Yeah. And, and, and not to mention uh, that in certain pragmatic uh, scenarios, the, the salami slicing you know, goes to the point of basically just making sure that there's power sharing, mm -hmm. not wisdom sharing. And that also is a discount to how you want to basically promote all, all the beautiful attributes of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Singapore has been practically run on a one political party system, despite the fact that it promotes the fact that it has more than one party. Mm -hmm. 
I, I know you've said this before, you know, I'm starting to sound more and more like a Singaporean, <laughs> but, but you got to give it to Singapore for being able to come up with a system that works, right? And whether the talent is situational or non-situational, uh, I'd like to be in a camp where, you know, it needs to be more situational, uh, but, but Singapore has been able to check the boxes properly for purposes of creating transparency, accountability, and the kind of meritocracy that the world over would want to be associated with. Uh, how they have not been able to perhaps give voice to the opposition is, is I think, uh, something that needs to be recognized, something that needs to be worked on. But within a liberal democracy, uh, I think the value with respect to the enforceability of rules and regulation the value with respect to, you know, how you want to promote integrity, how you want to pr promote morality, how you want to promote education, how you want to promote welfare, how you want to promote healthcare. Those, I think, are some of the boxes that Singapore probably has been able to check off a little bit better than some. Well, I mean, I think what you say can be subject to challenge. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be having this, uh, this conversation. Uh, and it's, it's not to say that I'm insensitive to your argument. I'm very sensitive to your argument. But a couple of things uh, occur to me. I guess one of them, which is really quite important, how can we possibly think of a Singapore model for Southeast Asia when Singapore has no agricultural sector, number one? I mean, Indonesia, good heavens, you, you cannot possibly discuss a model for Indonesia based on the assumption that the entire country is highly urbanized. That's simply not the case. We know here in the United States, the division that has occurred between, if you will, the meritocrats, if I can use that term, you know, with Ivy League degrees and all that kind of thing, and they have a lot of influence, and they're the ones that are quoted in the op-ed page of the New York Times and so forth and so on, right? But there's a huge gap. I used to live in Wisconsin, you know, the flyover zone, right, where the elites would you know, leave San Francisco and before they arrive in, in Washington, D.C. or Manhattan, right, they would look out the window. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch of people down there, right? Well, those people down there have been affected, some of them rather drastically, by all kinds of technological changes, many of which originated among the meritocrats here in Silicon Valley, right. where we are right now. Right. I wonder if you worry about, particularly, let's say, for Indonesia, not to mention other large countries in Southeast Asia, that... It's naive to think that you could encapsulate the Singapore model and parachute it into Jakarta and that that would really then take, as it were, in the larger, in the larger system. No, I'm not. I'm not at all. I, I'm being uh, yeah. unnecessarily I get it. harsh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, forgive me, but I think it's more interesting perhaps to the audience that we yeah. have some back and forth. I, I think it's, it's easy to interpret what I've said as if I'm promoting Singapore. But the point I'm trying to make is, I think the other nine Southeast Asian countries ought to take a look at some of the good things that Singapore mm -hmm. has done. Mm -hmm. They are completely different systems, right? And they are not small potatoes. Right. Going back to your comment with regards to agriculture, Indonesia has about more than 40 million farmers, mm -hmm. right? So that amounts to about, what? Right, I would guess 15 to 17 percent of the population, mm -hmm. which is an indication of a few things. Number one, it's got a lot of constituents. Number two, it's probably mm -hmm. not that efficient in terms of producing agricultural products because there are many other agriculture countries, including the US, including many European countries, that have been able to produce a lot more agricultural products with the employment of less than 5% of the population. That I think is a manifestation of the degree to which they can strike the right combination of the number of people they have, but also with technological innovations. Te technology is not always good. It comes with good things, but it also could come mm -hmm. with bad things, mm -hmm. right? And greed exists anywhere. It could exist in Silicon Valley, as we've seen in some cases in recent months. Greed has existed in Wall Street. Greed could exist anywhere. So 
do we see Indonesia being able to reduce the number of farmers from 17% of its population to a much lower number? In time, it does. Mm -hmm. It will. If it's resolute with respect to basically taking advantage of technological innovations and making sure that the dislocation mm -hmm. is properly managed for purposes of not just urbanization, but re-urbanization. And, and that is, I think, something that needs to be in the picture, not just for Indonesia, but for the Philippines, the Thailands, the Vietnams, and the Malaysias of the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of like in a camp that believes and thinks that I think the number of farmers in any particular country should be less than 10%. And that, I think, is a manifestation of how a country is cognizant of the importance of taking advantage of people and farmers as, as constituencies, but also taking advantage of technological innovations. How those two would vote for purposes of politics and policy making and economic development, it, it really boils down to what we've been talking about, the governance and the leadership of that particular country. And the governance and the leadership of that country presumably is a little hard to reduce to a high score on these. Absolutely. I mean, think of it for a moment. If you told the farmers in Indonesia that you wanted them to disappear in time, I mean, not right now, uh, but that their kids and their kids' kids and so forth should rely on this technology. Technology, which frankly has already demonstrated, yes, its capacity to disrupt, but not necessarily to do so in a constructive way. I mean, think of the debate, although this takes us a little far afield as to the impact on truth, right? <laughs> uh, you know, the availability of all kinds of uh, outright lies to which individuals, again, you're right, education is crucial. If you don't have the education to separate the truth from, from falsehood, uh, you're in trouble. And so politically, what you suggest, it seems to me, is more difficult to do than to think in terms of the technology. And if leadership then depends on unique characteristics, including empathy, I mean, you meant, let's go back to Singapore, right? We all know, and you and I have talked about this, we, we all know that there was a time when if you were living in a particular neighborhood of Singapore right. and your neighborhood had not voted for the PAP, but voted for one of the other uh, papers, uh, parties, it is possible that lo and behold, the garbage pickup, you know, which used to happen on time, you know, 8 a.m. Thursday morning, all of a sudden it's late and then maybe it doesn't happen at all. And frankly, there was some very frank exchanges that indicated quite clearly that the leadership of the PAP thought, you know, listen, if you're not going to get on board, why should we take care of you, right? Now, you know, how, how would you respond? That, you know, there's another point as well with regard to Singapore. They have done a very good job, it seems to me, with regard to the pandemic. I mean, I think that has to be admitted. Among other things. But where was their vulnerability? Their vulnerability was that they forgot about labor coming in from outside, living in dormitories that ended up breeding the virus, right? Which is exactly what you would expect from a technocratic elite that doesn't have empathy, right? Okay, these are just, you know, they're like, you know, uh, machines or something, you know. Now I'm being a little harsh, uh, admittedly. But how do you build something like that into a country like Indonesia, let alone the other countries of Southeast Asia, which we really haven't talked about yet, some of which are in extremely dire straits. I think of Myanmar, for example. Right. You know, what a disaster uh, that is. And then the last thing I would say is let's remember that roughly three fourths of the population of Singapore is ethnic Chinese. How much does that explain their trajectory in history over time? And how much does that limit? the generalizability of the Singapore model. Okay, that's about six or seven questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm really but, dumping but, them. No, know, no, no. It's, if it's I were great. you, I would get up and walk away. I would say, that's it, Don. No, no, yeah, this goodbye, is, goodbye. This, this is why I'm enjoying this. Because, <laughs> no, we, we, we can only grow and develop by way of a rich discourse. You are pushing me and the audience for a rich discourse, right? Going back to the earlier comment on technology being empowered, for agricultural purposes. I'll give you one simple example. Indonesia's productivity on rice is seven tons per hectare. 
the productivity of rice in Thailand is 14 tons per hectare. Not to mention Indonesia is one of the most diabetic nations in the world mm -hmm. and rice has a lot of glucose, mm -hmm. right? So one way to basically eschew diabetic tendencies is to reduce your consumption of rice. And if you can actually engage in technological innovations for the improvement of productivity from seven tons per hectare to 14 tons per hectare, we would be the biggest exporter of rice mm -hmm. on top of the fact that we've reduced our consumption of mm -hmm. rice on a per capita per year basis mm -hmm. if we want to be not diabetic. And that's going to bring about foreign exchange in a big way. That's one immediate applicability of technological mm -hmm. innovation within the agri or the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. Now, Singapore, as much as it is predominantly Chinese ethnically, it's proven to many of us in Southeast Asia and hopefully to the world that it's been able to preserve its multi-raciality, multi-racial, mm -hmm. multi-ethnic, multi-religious in a harmonious fashion, right? Relatively speaking here, right? And that is something to be spoken of in a good way, I think. It could have turned out much worse as we have seen in not so mm -hmm. far away countries from Singapore within Southeast Asia. We've had, you know, other countries in Southeast Asia that have, have gone through certain episodic stresses by way of ethnicity, by way of religion, by way of race. And you have been a witness to how easily the race card would have been played in so many countries around the world. The fact that it has not in Singapore for decades I think that speaks mm -hmm. volumes. Mm -hmm. Now, with regards to the garbage not being picked up just because these guys in a particular zip code mm -hmm. did not vote, it really boils down to time frame, right? And, and we've kind of like talked about this earlier, right? I mean, if, if you want to focus on the now, it's probably not a good picture, but if we put this in the context of the long term, where these guys that let's call it would have been punished, they've actually been able to witness how governance has or will be helpful to their future welfare, well being, and all that. And I think Singapore has delivered for the most part mm -hmm. on everybody there's been some resentment amongst people that have not basically been in line with the prevailing you know leadership or, or or government but but i think overall the quality of public service for everybody cannot be underestimated and you are not a singaporean you've been to singapore you have experienced the quality of public service, mm -hmm. right? You do not necessarily <clears throat> share the views of the PAP. On some accounts, many others perhaps don't, but I think they've done a pretty damn good job in making sure that public service is something that they would account for, you know, for, for everybody. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to really overstep my role as, uh, <laughs> as the, the, the host. and. Um, make the following argument, and if you don't mind, try really quickly to connect it to a little bit of an anecdote. Anecdotes, first, the plural of anecdote is not data. You've got data. All I have here is a tiny little uh, anecdote. But um, in, in, in the times that I have gone to Singapore repeatedly over the years, right? Now, this is no longer the case. But back then, as you may well recall, uh, there were requirements that, uh, for example, um, if you were driving a taxi, if you just picked me up at the airport at Changi and you were taking me to a hotel and it was probably 2 a.m. or something in the morning and I'm tired as hell and I want to go to bed and I want to go to the hotel, so I want you to drive fast, right? There is, in fact, a little gadget in your taxi cab that if you exceed yeah. the speed limit, it goes, it's actually mellifluous. It's very pleasant. Bing, bing, bing. And so it would go on. And I, being a savage American, right, 
uh, not accustomed to the kind of social control that we have in Singapore, I would say to the driver, you know, this is ridiculous, man. I mean, come on, there's nobody around. It's, there's no one, this is completely safe and so forth. Why don't you just speed up? I'm tired, I wanna to go to the hotel. And the, tra the cab driver, I have to identify his ethnicity, ethnically Chinese. This is not a Malay driver. Okay. Would look into the rear view mirror and he would say, can you imagine what would happen if I did that? If I did that, all the other taxi drivers, they would speed, they would be going hundred kilometers an hour. My God, it would be a disaster. It would be chaos. There would be you know, violence and so forth. And, and I'm thinking to myself, what a lucky man Lee Kuan Yew was to be able to rule such a governable population, right? I well, mean- You gotta take into account and, and, what he had and, done before that to make sure that these guys, are compliant. Well, I, I'm not criticizing the, Singapore's policy. And why should I put my self-interest in getting a good night's sleep above the safety of other people? I mean, that's ridiculous. That's arrogance, right? But what I'm trying to say is that that is relatively unique. Right. If, you, if, you, if you're in a traffic jam in Bangkok, for mm -hmm. example, uh, this just he doesn't could. arise, right? Uh, and likewise, in a number of the other countries in Southeast Asia. So what I'm trying to say is that there is something about the population that has to be factored in to a meritocratic view that con concentrates more on the elite. Some populations are more easily ruled than others. I guess I could maybe put it that way. And I'm not trying to tear down what you propose. If it reduces corruption, if it increases uh, economic development, uh, education, I'm, I'm all in favor of it. Right. But I'm just not sure that the Singapore model is necessarily the way to go. And then the other thing I would but, say is that we again, I'm not, I'm going not promoting. No, no, right. No, no, one size fits all. Yeah. I'm not yeah. promoting right. the Singapore right. model right. as the absolute, you know, must have. Right. 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 Uh, I, I, I have been laying out uh, the observations that they've been able to get more capital from the rest of the world, a lot more, disproportionately a lot more. Right than the others right yeah. i think there's got to be a few things that work and and one of which which is an important attribute of a liberal democracy is that the rule of law yeah money travels from one place to another just like water it travels because it trusts the destination the reason why money travels from all parts of the world to singapore is because the holder of that money trust the system yeah, in yeah. Singapore. You go to a court <clears throat> in Singapore with a favorable legal position, you are more than likely to win mm -hmm. because the judge is properly compensated. Yeah. He is properly educated. Yeah. He's gonna be able to adjudicate yeah. and come up with a judgment that I think is fair. Mm -hmm. Now, would that happen automatically in other parts of Southeast Asia or the rest of the world? Not so sure, because there are yeah. other conflicting, yeah. you know, observations. No, absolutely. So I, I, I think the fact that this guy is compliant with respect to that noise that comes out of the machine in the car is a speck of why the rule of law, mm -hmm. which works perhaps, you know, in favor of some people, not in favor of some other people, right. but it is one of the main considerations as to why holders of monetary and economic capital make a decision on moving that capital yeah. onto Singapore. Right. So I, I want to build a case in that other Southeast Asian countries desire this economic capital more than anything because they want to build institutions. They want to make sure that talent is further enriched, education is further advanced. <clears throat> to the extent that they don't have the economic capital, then I think we're going to be moving at a much slower pace. Yeah. Let's expand the scope a little bit, if we could. Earlier this afternoon, uh, a colleague of mine in conversation, I happened to be there as well, basically asked you a, a, a rather sharp question, which he didn't phrase in the manner that I'm going to phrase it. You know, he was much more polite. But basically what he was saying, you know, does Southeast Asia really exist? Because we were thinking in terms of the region. As we are here, I mean, your charts, for example, are regional in character. They go through country by country, right? Is there an argument to be made that it would tie in actually with your comments about Singapore? Because the idea here would be there are some countries in Southeast Asia 
that are capable of adopting or at least adapting the Singapore model, but then there are countries for which it is simply not possible, right? I mean, right now, Myanmar is just a bloody disaster. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that the notion of ASEAN solidarity, which you know has had its ups and downs, but the centrality of ASEAN, a kind of deeply ingrained, at least uh, rhetorically, I suppose, uh, belief, right, is now being challenged from within. There are people who are not in any sense radical that are saying, you know, maybe we should get rid of some of these members because you know they're. You know, Myanmar is an embarrassment to us. Why is Myanmar a member of ASEAN? Maybe we should just throw them out. But of course, that's not possible given the structure of ASEAN. So my question to you now is less the question of the content of say the Singapore model, but how you would go about establishing your model, this sort of new political economy for the whole region. Is that not really impossible? In, in the near foreseeable future, it's not a possibility. But in the long, who knows? Yeah, right, right. But one thing's for sure, it's a region that's been relatively much more peaceful and stable than others. You know, we've gone through this mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a set of numbers, right? The number of casualties in Southeast Asia in the last 2000 years has not been any more than 10 million. In Europe, there's a, what, 200 million people have died because of frictions, differences of opinions and views. I think that's a pretty good start. In 2000 years, not more than 10 million people have died. Mm -hmm. Are we as good you know, as you would want it to be as a liberal democracy? No. This is why we're having this discussion, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get better? I think one way to get better is to have a better understanding of what system <clears throat> has worked a little bit better than others and how the economic capital that's in abundance beyond the region needs to be or could be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. But that could only happen if talent intersects with power more optimally. Mm -hmm. It hasn't. And and you you alluded to you know the post-truth era where feelings are more important than imp empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. you know, sentiments play a bigger part and at the rate that you know people look at their handphones for 10 hours a day. They look at TikTok and Instagram, it matters more for people to attain a position of leadership or if, if he or she puts model in his face, her face, dances, starts sensationalizing as opposed to intellectualizing. On TikTok. On TikTok and Instagram. <laughs> Aren't you glad you don't have TikTok and Instagram? <laughs> but most people do have it. And, and you know, have you tried to come up with an explanation as to why people take a picture of the food that they're eating, the same food that they're eating every damn day. But that's the kind of post-truth era that we're living in. And, and you, you, you try to figure out, how am I going to be able to usher proper talent into a position of leadership, proper talents into governance underneath that leadership? I think there's a discount here. So... Uh, my, my point is that I think Southeast Asia has got its work cut out, but there is a set of enormous opportunities out there. Yeah, right, absolutely. And my last question is this. How do you think your ambitions and your vision, if I can put it that way, for Southeast Asia is affected by the US-China split right now and the role of China? Is China an essential ingredient into the solutions that you propose uh, or not? I think ever since the Asian financial crisis, 1998, there is a high degree of dependence by and amongst the business or entrepreneurial elites right. in Southeast Asia right. upon Chinese financing. And this is this is empirical, right? A lot of the banks in China have been supportive of the resuscitation of many entrepreneurs throughout Southeast Asia mm -hmm. who happen to be predominantly Chinese. The sentiment towards China is not negative. And if you want to take into account the potential conflict between the United States and China, 
I'm, I'm not in a position to measure how imminent that is, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's, there's been lots of conversations about what could happen in Taiwan, what could happen in Southeast Asia. But yeah. from an economic standpoint, the interdependence or the interconnectedness between the United States and China, we kind of talked about this earlier, just a collective trade between the two would amount to about 700 billion US. That translates to the employment of hundreds of millions of people on both sides of the Pacific Ocean. China and the United States. Do I think that that's just going to be, you know, decoupled just like that? I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Right. As much right. as people right. want to see, you know, something, you know, more, you know, of vitriol taking place in Taiwan or South China Sea. I think for the most part, the elites in Southeast Asia are of the view that nothing bad is going to happen to Southeast, Southeast Asia, be it in the context of Southeast South China Sea mm -hmm. or also the Taiwan situation, mm -hmm. at least for now in the near foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Are they right? I'm not in a position to say that they're right or wrong, but that I can give you sort of a pulse check on where people yeah. are <clears throat> thinking of what could happen or what would not happen. Yeah. I mean, we're going a little far afield here, but when you say some people think nothing bad is going to happen. Uh, my answer to that would be something bad has already happened. In other words, the expansion of China uh, into these little bits of land in the right. South China Sea, yeah. and there's the militarization. militarization. I mean, so, so this is a serious problem in relation to uh, Southeast Asia. But I think it's now time to shift into uh, the question uh, period, if I could. Let me start with a question from my colleague, Tom sure. Singer, whom, uh, ah, okay. whom you have met. Um, okay, it's about corruption. Is corruption primarily an impediment to domestic development in Southeast Asia or to foreign investment? Maybe the implication there is that, well, anyway, I won't even try to draw an implication. That's the first question. But related to that, under what circumstances does corruption have functional utility by making it easier to get things done, right? What does it take to persuade a corrupt elite to make the changes to the system? that would enhance equity and perhaps accelerate growth and foreign investment, but at the cost of their own privileged position. Getting back to the problem of elitism. Any comments on that? Well, I mean, we, we kind of saw this in a big way, right, in the 90s, when many, not most of Southeast Asian countries were growing at 7% annual growth rate per year. One way to measure corruptibility in a context of a robust economic trajectory mm -hmm. is to look at the i core the incremental capital output ratio. Mm -hmm. Those were the years when <clears throat> many Southeast Asian economies were running at very high i core meaning there was a lot of leakage. So I'm not suggesting that corruption is a well-needed commodity for <laughs> you know, an economy to grow at 7%, but it was one of the things that basically made the economy move at such a high speed. But ever since China joined the WTO in 2001, and ever since the Asian financial crisis, things kind of like got disrupted. And we're, we're no longer in the 7% economic growth rate per annum mm -hmm. zone. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I, I'd like to believe that, you know, corruptibility is there and will be there for a good while in many parts of Southeast Asia. But is this more of a domestic thing as opposed to an international thing? I think it's both, mm, yeah. really, because, because, you know, to the extent that you're not going to have enough money to educate the people, to the extent that you're not going to have the good quality teachers to teach the young, to the extent that you're not going to have the capacity to compensate the public servants adequately, if not more than adequately, uh, there are always going to be temptations for corruptibility. Uh, and corruption takes two to tango, right? I'm in, the, I'm in the camp that basically looks at countries like Indonesia, where we've taken a bold step to improve the spending on education up to 20% of its government budget. Talked about this. There is still a discount because it 
it is predominantly decentralized to more than the 500 regional mm -hmm. points where the quality of leadership is not consistently good amongst all 500. But taking the long view by way of making sure that democratization is underway in an incrementally good way in the long run, the leakage by way of decentralizing the money for purposes of educating the people in more than the 500 points of contention in Indonesia, I think it's only going to get better. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. taking the long view, I think, entails more optimism than taking the short view. Do you think as part of your uh, vision for the future of Southeast Asia that um, heads of state, ministers, uh, people who are, in a sense, are supposed to be disinterested and serving the public interest, all of them should receive extremely high salaries as a disincentive to corruption? I think that's the baseline. That's yeah, a good idea. That's the baseline. But beyond that, you got to make sure that whoever gets paid is go of good quality, mm -hmm. right? I think that's right, that's right, that's that's right. the the other structural issue, right? Where you right. do not have a proper alignment between talent and power yeah. at any level, not just at the leadership, but within the governance. And and I'd like to go back to the political fragmentation point again. Right. When you do not share ideological values, you do not share how you want to manage the fiscal space, monetary space, foreign policy space, and all that good stuff. You basically share power. You don't yeah. share things that I think uh, would be of commonality to the people. Right. Okay, here's a question on education from uh, Alexander Arikianto. Okay, <clears throat> he's from uh, uh, RSIS and so forth. Um, with approximately 55% of Indonesians aged less than 40 years old, there's certainly lots of potential in terms of education, talent, potential for human capital development that indeed over time could have turned the country into a giant economic powerhouse. But educational achievement of Indonesians are still far below their Southeast Asian peers, as the data you presented indicates. So my question is this. How could an upcoming Indonesian government make rapid changes in the country's educational system so that Indonesia could create highly educated, talented, and entrepreneurial people coming out of this huge generation of young Indonesians? And his emphasis is on speed and effectiveness. I think it's not only a question of quality, but it's a question of scale, right? Let, let me talk about quality first, right? The day we can recruit a good quality teacher from anywhere, including Palo Alto, to teach in Sumedang, to teach in Tarakan, to teach in mm -hmm. Pula Rote, that would be the day of reckoning when we know education is going to move the right, right way, right. right? There's this, you know, empirical evidence about how if you select teachers that come from the top 20 percentile, they can actually teach within a year, about a year and a half's worth of teaching. Whereas if you select teachers from the bottom 20 percentile, they can only teach half a year's worth of teaching in one year. Unfortunately, the fact of the, the fact is that, you know, not just in Indonesia, but in many countries in Southeast Asia, they have basically chosen teachers that are coming from less than the top 20 percentile. Right. That's the first in terms of non-tertiary. In terms of tertiary education, in addition to the fact that we suffer from good quality teaching, we are also not taking advantage of the technological innovations that are taking place in places like Germany, China, the United States, Japan, South Korea, and Australia at the kind of scale that perhaps other countries are taking advantage of. I've shared the example where in the 1980s, when I was here in the US, we had 16,000 Indonesians studying. Right now, we, we have less than 9,000 Indonesians studying in the US at any given university. Uh, that, I think, is, is, is a reflection of the less or the lack of hunger we have with respect to pursuing technological innovations. So there has been some rotation from the, those that would have gone to the US to those that would have wanted to go to places nearby, such as Singapore, Malaysia, and Australia. But uh, we could do a lot more. And is it the time when Indonesia could actually afford to send a lot more than 8,500 or 9,000 people to the United States? 
absolutely. There is no reason for Indonesia not to be sending 100 to 200,000 people to the United States, China, Japan, Germany, Australia, and all the, you know, the, the, the places where you know, we could get the best kinds of education. And this applies to all the other Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. Next question asks this, and I'm gonna simply summarize the question. Do you think that a high priority should be placed on vocational education, including STEM fields, rather than the standard notion that, you know, you study social science, maybe a little bit of philosophy, you get a degree, maybe if you're able to, you get another degree, you know, that that kind of preparation doesn't really solve the problem that you're trying to deal with, which is really economic development and growth and welfare. And so I, this is a critique, obviously, that's often addressed to the United States. I mean, the Germans have a record, an excellent record of this kind of training. Uh, that's one reason why they're a manufacturing, or at least they were a manufacturing superpower almost, right? Does that make any sense? In a, in a, and, a, and since this is maybe too much on Indonesia, because we should be talking about Southeast Asia as a whole, does that make any sense in a Southeast Asian setting? Emphasis I, I, on I think in, in most parts of Southeast Asia, vocation is the low hanging fruit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Most parts of Southeast Asia, they don't speak English. Vocationally, you could actually teach somebody in Lao, somebody in Cambodia, right. somebody right. in Vietnam. Somebody, By example. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You can turn right. somebody in two to three months to be able to speak English right. to the point where he or she could actually be employed at a three, four or five star hotel. I, I think that the main product is that this person could could, could could get a job as a concierge at a hotel, but the byproduct is that all of a sudden after three months of vocational training, he has the confidence to do much bigger things. Mm -hmm. That to me, I think is, is, is part of the nation building. Do we have to focus just on vocation? No, right. I think we have to do both, you know, vocational right. training and also tertiary training. Yeah, there's other, other questions here on the uh, educational system different approaches, social science collection, liberal arts, and so forth, which, you know, go over this, this issue again. You, you can feel free to comment on that, but I think you've already addressed at least uh, the core question. Okay, uh, here's another one. Um, this takes us to geography. We haven't talked about geography yet, but this is, this is wonderfully wide-reaching. You know, a critic would say this is very shallow, but precisely because we're talking about so many different things, but I don't think so at all, and particularly your slides are anything but shallow. They're, they actually delve into the respective topics quite deeply, if I may say so. Okay. The challenge of a maritime island nation like Indonesia and the Philippines is different from a continental nation like the US or China. And I guess the question then is, <clears throat> well, the, 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 the person asking the question continues. That obviously, that's, that's a basis for you to respond, but goes on to say, in terms of meritocracy and enforcement, of steps against uh, corruption, distribution of the national budget in provinces and so forth, that this emphasis on provinces, on the vast reach of Indonesia, rather than focusing so much on Jakarta, on the capital city, that that would be the key to reducing corruption. I'm not quite sure the connection between the comment about continents versus right. uh, archipelagos, but I, let, let me change that a little bit and just ask you, are there, Challenges that Indonesia faces or that the Philippines faces, or can we talk about Philippines as well, that have to do with the character that they have as archipelagic nations? Absolutely. I, and I what are those challenges? The, the, the Philippines and Indonesia share a lot of things in common, but, but one of the common you know, characteristics between the two countries is the centripetality of economic development, where you have much more robust growth right. uh, at the center vis-a-vis -vis the regions who are living on those thousands of islands, right? And the other centripetal nature is basically the much more robust growth of the elites vis-a-vis -vis the non-elites, right? So it is, it is a, a common denominator between countries like the Philippines and Indonesia uh, I wish there would be a lot more centrifugality right. in terms of the economic development, right? Uh, but but that requires, you know, better leaderships also, 
in the regions, right? Who could make sure that the talents don't just go to the capital city. We have seen in past decades where the good talents from the regions, you know, they only want to be in the capital city, be it Manila or Jakarta or Phnom Penh or what. Uh, that, that, that has been a challenge. Another question from one of the audience. Indonesia is now chair of ASEAN. What should Indonesia do during its period as chair of ASEAN? Well, I think it's likely to be a repeat of what we saw last year uh, in terms of the chairmanship of, of ASEAN. I, I do not foresee any you know, proactive voice with regards to what needs to be done with Myanmar, uh, what needs to be followed up on, you know, certain things that need to be remedied uh, in a in a quick fashion. Uh, but that's that's that has been the characteristic of Southeast Asia. That has been the characteristic of of ASEAN. I I do foresee you know uh, a possibility of basically underlining uh, some of the you know, narratives that would have been articulated at the, you know, the G20 in Bali, uh, and also what would have been narrated uh, in Bangkok at the past uh, ASEAN summit, be it in the context of how global finance ought to be more helpful and healthcare ought to be done and climate uh, change, you know, ought to be addressed uh, by Southeast Asian countries. Uh, I think it's gonna dovetail to, you know, the, the usual suspects. This question, <clears throat> which I'm summarizing uh, and making it a little perhaps more of a critique than the uh, person mm -hmm. asking the question intended, would it not be a good idea if instead of presenting a vision of the way things should be, at least in a long run sense, and perhaps a vision that would imply a really successful Indonesia, success defined or successful Southeast Asia defined along your lines, but rather than do that, why not develop a minimum acceptable status? Um, so, so in other words, instead of going for the top, which may be, you know, if everybody joins the crusade, that's fine. But the very fact that it may be idealistic could then narrow one's motivation to continue to work for it, right? Um, so what about the idea of establishing, you know, improvements, but that are baseline improvements from which further development should occur. How about that idea? A sort of a different approach than what you've adopted. That's a great idea. We've done stuff like that, but it probably hasn't come out as tangibly as you would have wanted mm -hmm. ASEAN countries mm -hmm. to, to do, uh, whether it is in the context of you know, economic cooperation, whether it is in the context, not just amongst ASEAN countries or Southeast Asian countries, but between ASEAN countries and, you know, other groupings or other international communities. Right. But, but in, in political, you know, social security dimensions, uh, I think there have been some baseline <clears throat> achievements that would have been agreed uh, upon by these member countries, uh, but probably not to the extent of ambition Right, as as you would want it to be. Right, right, right. Fair enough. Fair enough. How you know you have I, talked? I, I think Southeast Asia suffers from being perceived as not being too ambitious, right? Mm -hmm. But that also is a manifestation of how we would have wanted to keep peace and stability mm -hmm. together. So it comes at a discount. You. You maintain peace by way of your pragmatic approach towards life, but you sacrifice yeah. certain things that would have been, I think, reflective of certain ambitions. You have earlier referred to the um, uh, Hindu, Muslim, uh, Buddhism, Buddhism, the religious backgrounds that go back for right. you know, centuries and so forth. And I think I may be reading this into what you said, but I think your argument was that, that that's really remarkable and it shows you the maintenance of a rather high level of peace in Southeast Asia. Now, this question poses it in a different context. To what extent do you think <clears throat> those longstanding cultural proclivities would limit, perhaps, make more difficult the kind of new political economy 
that you're suggesting? Well, I hate to bring up Singapore again, right? Okay. Singapore okay. has okay. embraced the okay. culture of principles to some extent. And I'm, I'm quoting somebody here. And they've been able to be very resolute about promoting education, right? right? And by way of that resoluteness, they've been able to get ahead, far ahead compared to their peers. Mm -hmm. Whereas Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. more broadly, I think they've been able to embrace the culture of pragmatism a lot more than the culture of principle. Yeah. As a result of embracing this culture of pragmatism, mm -hmm. they have put a lot more premium and priorities on peace and stability at the expense of education, at the expense yeah. of certain things of principle. Mm -hmm. So do we have proclivity towards embracing a culture of principles? Probably not in the near future, which is why I want to mm -hmm. bring up the point about <clears throat> how Singapore has been able to live in a culture of pragmatism while promoting the culture of principles mm -hmm. that have entailed massive you know, amounts <clears throat> of education for their people, right. which fortunately I think has translated to you know, a good degree of governance and leadership that has brought about you know, meritocracy. I'm now going to share a viewpoint <clears throat> from one of the audience um, with which you may or may not agree. <laughs> um, but it is defensible to some extent, given the content of what you've said uh, so far. At least that's my own view. OK, so this individual, Mirawati Lestari, says, what we need, what we just need, is one great leader. <laughs> now, great, we can define that in different yeah. ways. What we need is just one great leader with the desire to make his or her nation be prosperous, no matter whether it's democratic, communist, monarchy, whatever. So this is a concentration on the power of a great leader to do the right thing. Is that an inference from what you have said that you encourage no. or discourage? No. Or what? <laughs> no, I don't want to be misunderstood as if I'm endorsing particular or any ideology, right? But this isn't an ideology. Yeah. It's just well, I mean, we need a big leader. A big. It depends on how you define great, right? Yeah, right. Greatness right, right, could right. be interpreted as of something that's existing in an autocracy. But but I'm I'm in a camp that wants to see greatness in the context of liberal democracy, yeah. where the opposition gets a voice, where rule of law works, right. and foreseeability of rules and regulations do work. But but let me let me add to this though. We, we live in a post-truth era where it's gotten tougher to find good quality people <clears throat> to fill in governance, to fill in positions of leadership. And we have seen a rising tendency of leaders or leaderships all over the world, not just in Southeast Asia, that have been selecting talent a lot more based on patronage. Yeah and or loyalty, right. as opposed to meritocracy, right. right? At the rate that this continues for a while, it's going to get very tough for countries like Southeast Asia. And, I, and I'm all the view that consider the possibility that in 1960, Singapore would have been governed by somebody like Robert Mugabe. Right, as opposed to Lee Kuan Yew. Yeah. I'll bet you a donut, Singapore would have turned out differently. Right. Yeah. So there is mm -hmm. a sense that leadership selection or leadership election are acts of serendipity. Right. Yeah. I think it's possible to hypothesize that because you, you would be tempted to think that in an advanced country, You've got all the institutions working to basically usher in a good quality leadership. Not necessarily so. We've seen some discounts in some developed economies or developed yeah. countries. Yeah. I think it is even more difficult in a developing country setting 
to ensure that the guy that's going to come up at the top is somebody that's of wisdom, greatness, and all that at the rate that the institutions actually do not promote the necessary, you know, yeah, attributes right. that you would want. Right, exactly. Well, there's one question that I think I can answer. Although if you would like to try to answer it, you are more than welcome. And it is a question from an anonymous attendee. Oh, I wonder why it's anonymous. <laughs> you should answer. <laughs> and the question is, are we going to get a certificate for participating in this <laughs> webinar? <laughs> We should think about, we can ask Chad GPT. Yeah, let's you know, ask Chad GPT. GPT would have an answer. They would have an answer, right, exactly. We, we, we should consider tokenizing this <laughs> session, you know, use, you know, NFT. Right, use an NFT, absolutely. <laughs> okay, right, okay. Well, there's another question about the future of ASEAN. In your judgment, do you think ASEAN will get progressively weaker, partly because of the differences that we've already talked about, or on the contrary, become stronger over time? I mean, that's a sort of a binary. It depends on time frame, right? Yeah, it's you know, right. I, mean, I, I, I yeah, think a lot of my American friends and European friends, when they, you know, yeah. express certain aspirations for ASEAN, you know, it, it's as if they would want those to get done tomorrow. Yeah. You know? And and I think people tend to forget the history of, of what ASEAN has yeah. gone through. Yeah. Another question says, how are you going to reach the bottom of the society? That is to say, the people who most need education but they're poor for various reasons. They don't have access, they're shut out. Uh, I think this is an excellent point because it raises the question of you know, how empathic a meritocracy can be. So are there special steps? I know the Minister of Education in Indonesia is a good friend of yours, but, but even speaking more broadly, how can one get the education to the people who need it the most? And I'm talking here, I suppose, not about you know, a course on French literature. Uh, or for that matter, the literature of the United States. Um, it's something that is more practical. At the very bottom, people who are unemployed, hard to be employed, and so forth. And empathy is not going to get given. It's not no, a given. It's not, it's not. Right? It, it needs to be acquired to some yeah, extent. Yeah. And the acquisition of empathy or the provision of empathy depends on a lot of the stuff that we've been trying to talk about the last right. 20, 30 minutes. Right. But but I think one key observation that would basically entail the ability of the government and the governance to be sensitive to the needs of the bottom of the pyramid yeah. would be when you see the selection or a selection of really, really good teachers at the non-tertiary levels. And when that happens, I think those good quality teachers mm -hmm. would be the bridge of communication and pay they're... them well enough absolutely with their well if you don't pay them well enough yeah. i think chances are you're not going to be able to get them yeah. on board right. and, and i think the kind of open-mindedness to be very radical about it would be to the extent of being able to recruit a nobel prize winner from ethiopia to teach in kalimantan if that's the kind of open-mindedness that countries like Indonesia, Lao, Cambodia, Thailand, even Malaysia, you know, now they're 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 yeah. I think you know confronting some issues on the educational front uh, by way of the rise of extremism and all that. But I think that would be one illustration of when you can actually see some empathetic measures with re respect to the bottom of the pyramid. But because the teachers, I think, are the first on the ground to be able to do the pulse check on what's needed and what's not needed. One of the most common questions that circulates when we uh, ask about the foreign policy of Southeast Asian countries is the request, uh, sometimes put very forcefully, don't make us choose. You know, italics, capital letters, right? That is to say, don't make us choose between China and the US, right? So this question from one of the audience uh, says, well, okay, but is there tilting that's taking place? Maybe not a 100% choice, but are some countries, for example, tilting more towards China and away from the US? And then the questioner asks, is that in your opinion, if that were happening, is that a good thing? 
In other words, from your point of view, should they choose neither, both, one, the other? Why? What are the benefits? And you know, it's a big question. I, I think what, what often gets lost in translation is the fact that Southeast Asia has 700 million people. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is collectively, economically, $3.5 trillion. It's not a small potato. Why should it be pushed to the corner to choose to either use an iPhone or a Huawei? Yeah, right. Yeah. A, a, a region of such scale, I think, deserves to have a high degree of independence, <clears throat> the ability to have optionalities. And, and I say this with full sensitivity to the fact that what China and the United States have to offer are a great degree of complementarity to Southeast Asia and the people of Southeast Asia. There are things that China can do that the United States cannot do. There are things that the United States can do for Southeast Asia that China absolutely cannot do. And, and you know, we, we talk about how we wanna be better global citizens <clears throat> in the context of climate change, how we wanna achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. I think both countries are well positioned to offer, you know, technological support for us to basically, you know, be able to try to achieve this carbon neutrality by 2050. And it boils down to who's going to have more money, who's going to have more economic, you know, capabilities uh, at the rate that a lot of the money is sitting in the United States, then in China, then within logic, I think the United States will be well positioned to offer both technology and economic support. They need to be conditioned on certain things, uh, on whether or not yeah. we yeah. can get our act together. Correct. But but I'm I'm you know I'm I'm just puzzled by the repetition of you know the comments from people that demand that we choose one over the other, mm -hmm. right? And and we have been able to basically coexist mm -hmm. for a long time with China for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's been some you know episodic stress, you know, some hundreds of years ago in the second millennium. Uh, we've been able to coexist with the United States also for a few decades quite well. Uh, no, no reason for us to to not be able to coexist, uh, you know, with with the both of you. Yeah. Well, there's also frankly an argument that, you know, the <clears throat> the case for uh, not choosing yeah. is not because we Southeast Asians don't want to lose our autonomy, right? But because we want to play China off against the U.S. and play the U.S. off against China. That is to say, as long as it's not, you know, violent, the competition between the two gives us an opportunity. You know, I mean, that's almost never Play one against the other. Yeah, maybe we can I mean, get a better, better prize on yeah, Huawei. Right. We can get a better prize exactly. on iPhone. Yeah. Now, there's another question that I'm going to spin out a little bit uh, that focuses on the latest technology. Mm. Artificial intelligence, DAL-E, right, in terms of visual, right? Chat GPT, you mentioned that the metaverse, right? Now, these are different uh, techniques, of course, but to what extent will the spread of these techniques, if, it, if they will in fact spread, I mean, it's possible to imagine that country after country bans this or bans that. Although again, the capacity to reinforce such a ban may be very difficult now with social media and so forth. So how do these particular innovations affect your notion of a new political economy for Southeast Asia? Do they put it in danger or can they be adapted and used to promote it, to encourage it in a good way? Well, it depends on the quality of leadership. Okay. Very in good. each country, yeah. right? right. It, it boils down to yeah. the very same topic we've been talking about, right? right? If he or she gets it, gets it in the sense that it's going to be net good for the nation, then I think it's going to be good. But it is indisputable that the role of AI is going to be so massive yeah. in our day-to-day. -day. Yeah. And, and we've known, yeah. Yeah. we've seen how AI <clears throat> continues to drop in cost by 50 to 60% on a yearly basis. And the applicability of AI onto agriculture, education, tourism, healthcare, real estate, energy, and all that good stuff. I can just see <clears throat> the increase of 
productivity by the orders of magnitude in any country where not just the leadership, but the people that he or she leads get it. I mean, you know, we can we can refer to so many reports, but there's quite a number of reports out there that basically have pontificated that in the next 10 to 15 years, the economic value proposition that's going to come out of AI is going to be about $100 trillion. I think it would be foolish for any Southeast Asian country not to take advantage of that possibility. Yeah. The counter, one of the counters mm -hmm. to what you've said, is that we are at the beginning of a titanic struggle. Right. Uh, and it's not just, you know, roses, 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 right? No, 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 no. It's a struggle between productivity, which you emphasize, and authenticity, right. knowing the origin of a piece of text or a picture. What happens to copyrights, right? I mean, uh, if if societies are no longer able to distinguish what is true from what is false, then you know our whole session is irrelevant. The, the, the I mean, national, well, yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 that's a playful. No, it's not irrelevant. You're anything. You're very relevant. I the, maybe the irrelevant. national <laughs> interest, the national interest in the minds of any leader is for the benefit of the people, right? whether or not the intellectual right. property sits with the nation, right? Yeah, as long as the people will benefit from the application of that technology, yeah. it doesn't matter where the- What if they sits. don't? What if they don't benefit? Well, it depends on the quality of leadership again, right? The wisdom right. and greatness of any leadership in any country, I right. think would be manifested. But, in... but I think there may be an overemphasis on personality, the leader, right. versus structure. Right, because the risk to authenticity and distinguishing truth from falsehood, it seems to me, requires structure. It, yeah. it requires not just a good leader, because maybe the next leader will be terrible, but you know the the difficult decision. You know, it's possible that we will be in a situation where, contrary to the standard conversation among liberal democracies, which is that censorship is a bad thing, all of a sudden, no, certain kinds of censorship including censorship of material that is inflammatory and that has no human origin, but is the product of, you know, well, maybe some human who is manipulating a computer. You see what I'm saying? The implications for structure of the, the political system, the viability of democracy, which relies on some faith in the individual, right? Rather than the faith in even the meritocratic case and some powerful leader. So, Don? there is a higher probability that the institution and the structure are gonna do the right things. Yeah, I hope if right. the leadership yeah. surrounds himself or herself. Okay. Talent or selects talent a lot more based on meritocracy right. as opposed to patronage and or loyalty. Right, right. I'm not, I'm not, you know, putting out a crystal ball here, yeah, but right. it, it goes back to the earlier observations. Another question <clears throat> raises the role of religion. Now, this is a specific example. We briefly talked about the Islamic, you know, Buddhistic and right. Hindu background, the history and so forth. But now in the 21st century, is religion going to be part of what you propose? Is it separate from, but not objectionable from the standpoint of what you propose? Or are there potential obstacles? Um, you know, the it was interesting to me when you were in Jakarta, I think you were there at the time of the G20, the recent G20, right? right? And as you probably know, there was also an R20 in Indonesia, which didn't get any publicity mm -hmm. to speak of, right? And the R stood for religion. And it was an effort to reach out to overcome the often very tense and difficult, you know, borderlines between different religions that preach different things, right? Uh, and I found it, you know, wonderful to read, perhaps idealistic, but nevertheless necessary. So how does religion play this, play into what you're talking about here for the future of Southeast Asia? Well, I mean, one, of, one of the values of liberal democracy is the freedom of religion. Right. And that's frankly what Yama said. It's not freedom from religion. Right. Freedom of religion. Right. And that's manifested in one of the principles of Pancasila. Right. And yeah, but if the religions are 
at each other's throat. Well, or if there are put it different, put it that's not right. Yeah. Put it differently. If there are extremists, I'm, the jihadists, right? Yeah. The Islamists, the radical Islamists. There have that has occurred in. We know that has occurred in Indonesia. Indonesia has been luckier than some other countries in that regard, but still. Yeah, but but I'm in the camp that believes that anything that's been portrayed as a religious phenomenon would have been politically motivated. I would argue okay. that the Rohingya okay. case was a political mo <clears throat> politically motivated. It's not a religious issue. Yeah. I would argue that the Uyghur issue in China right. is not a religious issue. It is a politically motivated issue. Right. I would I would argue that some of the, you know, what has been portrayed as a religious issue in other countries, I think would have been a lot more heavily politically <clears throat> motivated. Yeah. But it's how it's portrayed. And and go back to the number of fatalities that has taken place in Southeast Asia by way of differences of views, differences of religions, differences of race, differences of ethnicities. Yeah. It is minimal. It's less than 10 million in the last 2,000 years as compared to the 200 million people that have died in Europe. Just in a span of 35 years between World War I and World War II, 120 million people died. So that, that I think speaks of the innate, you know, okay. tendencies of Southeast Asians. We're gonna end on a question. I hope we have time for this. I think we do <clears throat> on a question that reverts all the way back to your opening remarks, which mm -hmm. were very much focused on economic matters, finance matters. And this is from the audience. <clears throat> we know <clears throat> that there is such a thing as not only Europe, but there is the euro, okay? Would a common currency, let's call it the Asiana, I just, you know, you heard that here, right? We have just invented this new currency. <laughs> Copyrighted. <laughs> the Asiana. Take a while then. Yeah, right. The Asiana, which would be a common currency for all the members of ASEAN. Is this uh, a good idea worth pursuing? Maybe not right away, but at least, in the near to the longer term future? Is it a terrible idea? What, no, what it's, it's a great idea, but is it implementable? No. By way of the divergence of the earnings or the earning power of the different nations. I mean, you go to Cambodia, it's, it runs on a GDP of $1,000 on per capita per year basis. Singapore runs at a GDP per capita of 73,000. How do you align those two economies from a monetary standpoint with different contrasting, you know, monetary and fiscal spaces. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and we've got yeah. 10 countries. Uh, Europe, yeah. I think, is completely on a different planet where, yeah. you know, there's not a whole lot of divergence in terms of earning uh, power, you know, at the individual level for all, you know, 27 members of the union. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in the next 10 years, unless you believe that Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar are going to reach a GDP per capita of 50 to 60,000. Yeah. Then it's it's something to think about. So um, economic growth would be a necessary absolutely. prerequisite. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And, and let me just underline the point and the possibility of AI being able to boost you know, the economic trajectory of many Southeast Asian countries, as long as we get our act together. Yeah in terms of linking between talent and power. Well, I like that as a proper ending, as long as we get our act together. And I hope the audience thinks that at least you and I have more or less managed to get our act together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. It's been extremely stimulating. Thank and thank you. you to all of you for the questions. I'm sorry I couldn't answer or pose all of them to, uh, to Gita, but it's been a great pleasure. And come back and see us again. Uh, and sign up for our emails and all of that. Take care.